Good morning. I would also ask you that you would uh, find Hebrews 11 as we are giving the sermon today we'll be speaking <clears throat> primary text Luke chapter 9 verse 37 through 42 secondary text Hebrews 11 I'm going to be speaking today about something that um, I would pray that everybody in this day and age in which we live recognizes how important faith is. This is going to be a discourse on faith. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 37. And it came to pass that on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. Behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he is mine only child. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out, and it teareth him, and he foameth again, and bruising him hardly departeth from him. <clears throat> and I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. Notice Jesus' reply. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. And as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down and tear him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. Let us pray. Lord, give us the stillness, the attentiveness of every heart. Help us to put away all distractions, all worldly enticements, everything else that can captivate our minds. Help us, Lord, to concentrate fully and intently upon you. That Jesus Christ be glorified. And that we be challenged to live by faith. To understand what faith is. What faith means. And what faith does. Bind our enemy, I pray. Give me the freedom to preach your word with conviction. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Has anybody ever referred to you as a person of faith? Has anyone ever referred to you as a person of faith? And if that has happened, what does it mean to be a person of faith? Could it possibly mean that there's some sort of uh, hidden virtue in just having faith? Could it possibly mean that because of our faith we can make things happen? that other people can't or don't make happen. What does it mean to be a person of faith? What is real faith? And I pray that your spiritual ears are tuned in because what I'm about to say is very important. There are people who place faith in their personal opinion, who place faith in the modern day trends that are going on in the world. There are those who place faith in popular opinion. But as Christians, we're to put our faith in God. Period. 
God. Can we all just get right to the point and acknowledge this fact that God has given his people great and precious promises? Great and precious promises. Uh, how can we know those promises and what do we base our faith on? Well, we have to base our faith, first of all, in those things that we know to be true. And how do we know it to be true? It's simply because God said it. God said it. It's recorded in his word. We, might, we have to believe it. And we have to live it. In faith. In faith. We have to live it in faith. You know, uh, in the text today, you have to understand that the disciples had already been given the ability to cast out demons. And then when this demon-possessed boy is brought to the disciples for them to cast out a demon... By the way, a very vicious demon. One who literally wanted to kill this young man. It's written that the disciples could not cast him out. And you say, well, what's the problem, guys? Well, uh, let me rephrase this same question. And say, what's our problem sometimes? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Give it to me. Amen? Amen? What's our problem sometimes? Uh, I ask you a question. Did Jesus let his apostles know that they had the power to cast out demons? Yes. Yes. Had the disciples cast out demons before? Uh huh. Mark chapter 6 and verse 13 literally says they cast out many demons. It's not because of lack of experience, it's not because of lack of commission that they were given by Christ Himself, it's not because of a lack of ability. They were given that ability by Jesus. It all amounts to this one thing. They were faithless. Apistos, the Greek word here, means unbelieving. You would say, wow. How could somebody be unbelieving when they walk daily with Christ. By the time of this event, there was nearly three years of Jesus' ministry. Three years. They'd been with him. They'd seen his works. They saw his power. They had already cast out demons. And you would ask yourself, what's wrong? Well, let's bring this up to the modern day context today and say, what's wrong with us? When we look at the world and we see the direction it's going, I hope you're scared to some degree. But not scared in the way that most people usually get scared. Because God has given unto us great and precious promises. Is it not true that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world? Is it not true that if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, I know what everybody would like to do. They'd like to look and say, the whole world's against us. Yep. It is. 
And I'm going to tell you something you're going to think is absolutely ridiculous. Rejoice that the world is against us. You know why? John 15, verse 18 through 21 says, we're not supposed to be happy if we're identified with the world because the world hates Christ. The world will hate you if you belong to Christ. Rejoice. Yeah. Doesn't sound right, does it? Rejoice because I'm hated? Yeah. What is our identity? What is our identity? To be Christian means to be one with Christ. If they hated him, they will hate you. They will hate me. To be one, one with Christ. You know, so the apostles were given the power to cast out demons. And it appears that this demon looks so ferocious, so deadly, so overwhelming, that they must have believed that they couldn't do it. You know, when I think about this, and I put 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in us than he is in the world, together with 1 John 5, 4, it says we overcome the world if we're born from above. We overcome the world. How many knew that? We overcome the world. If we're born from above. And what is it that overcomes this world? Our faith. Our faith. Our faith. So when I said, I hope that everybody can see what's going on in the world and they're scared. I really do hope that. But not that you live in fear but that you live in faith. Amen? Amen. Faith. What is faith? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) You know, like the apostles, they're having this problem. They've been endued with the power that came directly from Christ. They've got this problem. You know, knowing that it's true that our faith overcomes the world, I think it important that we understand what faith is. Turn with me, please. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. I want to talk to you about a faith. And the importance of faith. The importance of not living in fear. But to have faith in God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You know what? The apostles in their mind couldn't see themselves casting out that demon. And it wasn't because Jesus didn't tell them that they had the authority to cast out that demon. It wasn't because they had never cast out a demon before. It was simply because they were faithless. That means unbelieving. They were unbelieving that they could do it. Kind of like a lot of people today that I see living the course of the world given to fear because of not understanding the promise. The promise that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. The promise that says our faith overcomes the world. You know what faith is? Faith is the substance 
of things hoped for. Now I want you to understand what we're talking about. Substance. This podium is of substance. I can see it. I can touch it. I can feel it. It's of substance. It means literally that faith is the substance. That means the reality, the outright assurance of those things we've hoped for. The evidence, the conviction, in other words, of those things we have not yet seen. But you know what you have to do in order to see faith at work? You got to step out. How many here know that before the Apostle Peter could ever find out if he was able to walk on water, he first had to get out of the boat? Maybe you're still in the boat. I don't know. But I hope what I'm saying is making sense to you. It's important. Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The hypostasis, the substance of what we hope for. The evidence of things not yet seen. Notice this. Verse 2 of Hebrews 11. The elders obtained a good report. How? By faith. Well, good report from who? I will tell you this much. It wasn't a good report from the world. Why do we know that? Well, because the world hates us. The good report came from God because of faithfulness. Verse 3 talks about creation. Listen to me. Was anyone here when God created the universe? Any of you? Any of y'all? Do you know anybody that was here when God created the universe? You ever find anybody that's alive today uh, when God created the universe? What am I trying to say? God gave us an accurate account of how he created all things. And it's found in his holy word. You know, I don't care what science teaches if it doesn't teach this truth, God created. God created. God created. We can be assured of God, the fact that he created. Look at it this way. He was the only one who existed when he created everything. He's the only one who would know. I wasn't there when he created. You weren't either, I hope. <laughs> if so, you was really old. God knows. God gave an account of creation. And by faith, by faith, we believe that account. You know, you read in Hebrews 11 about some interesting folks. How about Enoch? How Enoch was translated by God. To be translated means he had his own private little rapture. He was taken to heaven alive. How was he taken to heaven alive? Better question is why? Easy to, re easy to remember why. 
easy to remember how. Because he pleased God. How did he please God? By faith. By faith. By faith. It means he believed God. In order to be pleasing to God, you have to first believe God. You have to trust what he's saying. Then you have to move out in faith to obey what he said. It's that simple. Or I should say, it should be. It should be. Uh, did Jesus please God? Wasn't it on two different occasions that we have recorded in Scripture that the voice of God came from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. That's important. You know what Enoch was doing? Enoch was following the example of Christ. Christ believed his Father. Christ trusted in his Father. As a result, Christ obeyed his Father. How about Hebrews 11.6? Go ahead and look at it there in the Bible. Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Uh-oh. Well, that would appear that a lot of people today are not pleasing God. Amen? Because they're given to fear, they're living in fear, they're putting their faith and their trust in all different places except where they should be. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Why? Because you first must believe that He is. That's only part of it. Believing that God is isn't enough. You must first believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He rewards people for diligently seeking Him. Do you know that that's how faith is built? That's how faith is built. God says it. You believe it. You obey it. God rewards. Praise the Lord. Only God can do that. Let's take Noah. How many know that in the days of Noah, according to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 5, it had never rained. The reason it never rained is easy to understand. There was a diurnal dew that sprang up from the ground and watered the face of the earth. That's simply because the earth's environment in the beginning was much different than it is today. Much different. It had never rained. I want you to imagine this. God comes to Noah and says, Noah, I want you to build me an ark. Noah's probably thinking, this is going to be interesting. An ark is not a fishing boat. <laughs> an ark. Because hmm. Noah is going to flood the earth. I can see Noah saying, what does that mean? It hasn't even rained. But it's going to flood the earth. You got to think about this. Noah heard God. Noah believed God. Noah obeyed God. Even when it was totally and completely unreasonable by human standards to do so. Who would
did build an ark when it's never rained? Well, I'll tell you who. Someone who would believe God. Someone who would have faith that God knows what he's talking about. And I want you to understand from the text in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, Noah spent 120 years building that ark. That's a long time. Well, that was a big boat. Faith. Do you realize that Noah had to first believe God? Do you know that Noah had to understand God? Do you know that Noah then had to obey God? Faith involves the mind, the emotions, and the will. It's easy to understand, isn't it? Do you know that people can hear God reading the scripture? You hear God. Do you know, though, that if that hearing that the mind is subjected to doesn't translate it to the heart, the emotions of the person, meaning that they hear the truth of God, then their heart is pricked because of that thing we call conscience. And the conscience becomes troubled. And the emotions are in pain because all of a sudden there's this recognition that I'm contrary to God. then the will has to get involved. There is no salvation. There is no true saving faith. There is no real faith. If the mind does not hear and understand the Word of God. Romans ten seventeen, Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. That's where it starts. And then the conscience is troubled by what the mind just learned. And then when the will is redirected away from sin and toward God then a person has been changed Acts 3:19 says be says repent and be converted so your sins may be blotted out what does it mean to repent Madano in the Greek. It means to change your mind. That's where it begins. Your mind. Change your mind about what? Change your mind about your current condition of being lost. Change your mind about your current condition of living in sin. Change your mind. You notice that last part, be converted? Greek here, epistrepho, means to turn and go the other way. That's what conversion is. Can you see that it necessitates the bending of personal will? The bending of personal will. Being redirected away from the world, away from sin, and being redirected toward God. Saving faith. 
saving faith requires the engagement of the mind, the emotions, and the will. Let's look at Hebrews 11.4 for a moment. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. What's this mean? It means God told Cain and Abel both what he required. Abel believed God. Abel obeyed God. Cain did not. Abel is found here in Hebrews 11.4 in the hall of faith. Cain is found in the hall of shame. 1 John 3.12 says that Cain was of that wicked one and slew his brother. Here's something that I want everybody to hear very clearly. Faith has everything to do with denying self. Taking up the cross daily and following Jesus. In order for Enoch to be pleasing to God, do you think he didn't have to deny himself? He had to give it up. Considering what we've said about Noah, didn't he have to deny himself? 120 years building a boat. How about Abraham, verse 8? Let's look at this. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterward receive for an inheritance, he obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Can you begin to imagine the ridicule that Abraham faced? He packs up his wife, his 318 trained servants, He leaves his mother, his family, and he starts walking to a place that he didn't know where he was going. That takes faith. What is that faith based on? He believed God. He believed God. God told him, said, Abraham, start walking. When you get to where I want you to be, I'll tell you to stop. Faith. That's faith. Look down to verse 24 and 25. We'll look at this last one here. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I want to tell you something. You want to talk about somebody that'd be ridiculed. You ever been ridiculed for being a Christian? You ever been ridiculed for following Christ? You've got to imagine the ridicule that these people would have faced. Here's Moses. He had this opportunity to live in luxury in the opulence of the palace of Pharaoh. He could have stayed there. But get this. Moses knew his calling from God. How did he know it? Because God told him. 
He could have had what we would call the life of ease, the good life, living in luxury and worldly splendor. Instead, hear me carefully. Moses ended up living 40 years in the desert's wilderness of Midian. Oh, did I forget something? By the decree of God, that happened. God made sure that Moses left Egypt. Moses went and served his father-in-law, Jethro, 40 years. It's interesting when you look at this, what good did those 40 years do for Moses? Well, guess what he had to do the last 40 years of his life? (laughs) After living in the desert for 40 years, learned how to survive, how to take care of uh, sheep, Uh, He took care of a lot of sheep. The nation of Israel. God saw to it. God gave Moses precisely what he needed. Precisely what he needed. In order to follow him. Hebrews 11 is a chapter about people who through faith obeyed God even when from the human perspective it made no sense. Made no sense. You know, when Abraham set out on his journey after God commanded him to go, he didn't know where he was going, but you know what he did know? He knew that God knew where he was going. He knew that God knew where he was going. Noah had no idea what a flood was. He knew that God knew. He trusted him. Believed him. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so does easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Christian life is likened to a race. A race has a finish line. The finish line is the goal And there's no stopping until you go across that finish line. And I'm going to tell you that at times in this life, we do not see the finish line. And it could be for several different reasons. Maybe because of where we are on the field, on the track. Or maybe because we're distracted by everything else. You know the person that keeps his eye on the finish line? Knows where it's at. Knows how they've got to run the race. And that's the objective. In the same way that it's easy to take your eyes off the finish line. It's easy for Christians to lose sight of the spiritual blessing that lies ahead. It's easy. But we've been promised Great and precious promises. You know those cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, 1 speak about all those people that are in Hebrews 11. 
What can we learn from them? Well, by faith, they made it. You want to make it? By faith, they made it. They ran their race. They left a testimony for us to learn from. We need to hear God. It's right here in His Holy Word. We need to believe God. We need to obey God. Now, in comparison from the text last week to the text this week, having given at least a brief discourse on faith, we're going to see some contrasts between what we preached on last week and this week. Contrast between faith that was seen up on top of that mountain when faith literally for Peter, James, and John became sight. They saw the glorified Christ. They heard the conversation between Jesus and Moses and Elijah, they had their faith turned to sight. That was up on the mountaintop. Down in the valley, there's something totally different going on. Above, there's this spiritual light of faith. Below, there's a spiritual darkness of faithlessness. Look at verse 37 now. We're in the book of Luke, chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 37. And it came to pass that on the next day, when they were come down from the hill, much people met him. This is the day following the transfiguration of Jesus Christ that happened up on the top of the mountain where they saw uh, the glory of Christ, the glory of God. Uh, they had heard uh, Moses and Elijah uh, speaking with Jesus, and they heard the voice of God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Their faith had become sight, but as they come down from the mountaintop to the valley, they encounter the reality of living in a sinful world that is a void of faith. Now, I want everybody to understand that Luke's gospel is a very condensed version of this event. So I'm going to be referring to the other Gospels, Matthew and Mark, that also record this because it adds a lot of detail. Mark chapter 9 and verse 14 says, And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. So the disciples that were left on the ground... When Jesus went up to the top of the mountain, remember only Peter, James, and John went to the top. The other nine are down and down below. And this is who is being spoken about. They were being questioned by the scribes. Now, I want you to understand the context and what they were being questioned about. They were being questioned about why couldn't you cast out that demon? The reason we know that is because that's the context. Why couldn't you cast out that demon? Look uh, at Mark 9, verse 15 and 16. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed. And running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? Notice before an answer is given. Back to Luke's gospel here chapter 9, verse 38. A man stepped up. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, 
Look upon my son, for he's my only child. And lo, a spirit, that means a demon. And lo, a spirit taketh him, and he suddenly crieth out and tears him. That means it convulsed him. And he foamed at the mouth, and bruising him hardly departed from him. That means when the demon departed from this tortured soul, he left with great difficulty. The demon would go out of the person. He would enter the person. And he would torment and torture this young child every time these things would happen. Notice here, the father addresses Jesus as master. Then he calls him to look upon his only son. That means show compassion, take care. What do we learn about this young man? One, he was an only child. He was an only son. Sons were dependent upon back in those days to take care of their parents when their parents got old. This was his only son. Sons were also the progenitor of the family line. The family name was carried on by the sons. Notice also he was an, epilept he was an epileptic. Um, Luke, you have to remember, was a physician. He would have known uh, the symptoms of someone uh, having epilepsy. In Matthew 17, 15, it can cause some confusion if you look at that, where uh, Matthew uses the word translated as lunatic. And I will make this comment. It's probably because of the form of epilepsy that this young man had and how it affected his behavior that most likely he appeared to be out of his mind. Next we see is a demoniac, a victim of demon possession. And from Mark chapter 9, verse 25, we see that he was a deaf mute because the demon he could not hear or speak. Notice what this man says in verse 40 of Luke chapter 9. And I besought thy disciples to cast him out, and they could not. Now Mark 9, 17, it says the man originally came to Jesus, seeking Jesus to cast out the demon. So when Jesus wasn't there, he appealed to the disciples. And as we've discussed already from Mark chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, Jesus had previously given the apostles the ability, the power, the authority to cast out demons. Mark 6, 13, the de they cast out many demons, as we've already spoken before. And here's the point. There was no lack of available power. No lack of experience, no lack of commission, no lack of privilege, no lack of authority. Just a lack of faith. A lack of faith. Jesus called those gathered there that day faithless and perverse. Verse 41, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring thy son hither. That means they were unbelieving and twisted. You would ask the question, and you should ask the question, what were they twisted about? What's it mean, perverse? Well, they knew Jesus, right? They knew the power that Jesus had. They knew the power that Jesus had given them. The authority that he had invested in them. But suddenly, they were unbelieving, twisted. It's like Jesus was saying, you don't believe, even though I told you. You don't believe, 
even though I invested the power in you, yet you don't believe. It was too severe a situation for the apostles to get their mind around that they could have the authority to cast out that demon. Oh, faithless and perverse generation. You know, the issue behind this is simply, and I'm going to apply it to our lives today. God had revealed himself to the apostles in the past, had he not? Has God revealed himself to you in your past? Have you seen and experienced that God is always faithful to keep every promise he's ever made? Have you experienced the goodness of God? Have you experienced the glory of God, the power of God in your own life? Have you ever had God take you through really, really trying circumstances? And you've seen the hand of God at work. Well, Jesus is asking the question, how can that happen? And yet now, you don't believe. When we've seen the hand of God at work, when we've learned to trust him, when we've seen his provision, how can we not believe? Amen? How can we not believe? Well, Jesus reveals the issue. He had given them authority over all demons, not just some. Do we believe that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world or just in part of the world? Is God only greater than some of our enemies? Is God only greater than just some of our fear? It says greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world the world all of it Matthew 17 verse 18 through 20 and Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very uh, hour then the disciples came to Jesus and said why could we not cast him out and Jesus said unto them because of your unbelief in Matthew's gospel four different times Jesus referred to the apostles as O ye of little faith what was he asking them to believe in this text we're looking at today he's asking them to believe what he told them you have power to cast out demons. You have the power of God to cast out demons because I gave you that power. Yet they didn't believe. He wanted them to believe what he had done for them in the past. In the same way that he wants us to believe what he has done for us in our past. Amen? He was faithful then. Will he not be faithful now? He was faithful back yonder. Will he not be faithful today? You know, they had to learn <laughs> the same thing that we have to learn. If God said it, Believe it. God said it. Believe it. You know, Jesus is saying, how long shall I put up with you? 
How long will I put up with you? Put up with who? Faithless and perverse people. People that have every reason to believe. Because they've seen the hand of God at work. He says, how long will I put up with you? You know, it wasn't just the agony of being rejected. The agony of being crucified that brought Christ's suffering. He suffered because he lived among unbelieving people. He lived among unbelieving people. You know, given the confidence that he had in his father, the text reveals it was difficult to live among people who don't believe when they have every reason to believe. And I like what Mark reveals in Mark 9, verse 19 through 24. I'm going to look at this. He answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. Now listen, Jesus asked his father, how long is it since this has come upon him? Christ answered, from childhood. That means that obviously this young man was at least a teen. And the father had been dealing with this for some time. And he says, and oft times you cast him in the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. The demon was seeking to destroy him. When the child approached Jesus, the demon convulsed him, threw him to the ground. This had been happening since childhood. Can you imagine being that father? And all the time, all the effort, all the work being put into protect, protecting that boy? Notice Jesus' reply in Mark 9, 23 and 4. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Notice the father's response. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Have you ever needed to say that? Have you ever received the truth of God? And you know it's true, Brother Roger. But you say to God, Lord, help me now. I believe. Help my unbelief. You know, that man believed, but he needed help. Well, what's the greatest help that God can ever do for those who are struggling with their faith when they say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief? Well, the greatest thing that can happen is God just takes care of it. <laughs> and your belief becomes sight. And that's what happened. Jesus healed this young man. He returned him to his father, and his faith became sight. With every head bowed, every eye closed. I know. I'm not saying I think, I'm saying I know. This someone in here, just simply because you're human, 
and just simply because how the world confronts Christians. I know you've had problems with faith. Scripture is very clear. If God said it, you can believe it. If God said it, you can obey it. Because God is rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Who believe that he is. And they diligently seek him. Romans 14, 23 tells us that anything that is not of faith is sin. What's your spiritual condition today? Do you believe God? If you believe God, you will obey God because you will trust God. You will have confidence in what God has said. As our worship team leads us in a song of invitation, we pray. We pray. Will you pray for those struggling with faith? Will you pray for those living in fear rather than living by faith? Will you pray for yourself? This is a time of invitation.